Good morning, this is Radio Good News. The goal of this program is to draw all people to the love of Jesus Christ. I want everyone to know and experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are key to a Holy Spirit-filled and successful Christian life. I will focus on God's love because God's love is wonderful. I'm John Thornton. I'll be reading from the Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, because that is God's word to us in our language. And in fact, the fruit of the Holy Spirit I'm going to be focusing on in a home Bible study. If you'd like to be part of that, drop me a note and I'll give you the information. Let's begin today with a reading from Psalm 77, verses 1 through 14. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God that he may hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. I think of God, and I moan. I meditate, and my spirit faints. You keep my eyelids from closing. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, and remember the years of long ago. I commune with my heart in the night. I meditate and search my spirit. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love ceased forever? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And I say, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples with your strong arm. You redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Those are God's words from Psalm 77, verses 1 through 15. Our musical guest today is Amy Shreve. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought. By day or by night Waking or sleeping Thy presence, my light Riches I seek not Nor man's empty praise Thou mine inheritance Thou Wasn't that a beautiful old hymn from Amy Shreve? Sometimes old hymns are just wonderfully ministering to my soul. We'll hear from her again at the end of the program. Turn with me, if you can, to a beautiful section of Scripture, Matthew chapter 5, 
verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those are God's words from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. I really love the Beatitudes, where God has wonderfully told us the way, as Christians, our attitudes ought to be. So let's look once again into the Beatitudes. Jim Wallace is a pastor who works in a large urban center. In his wonderful book, Who Speaks for God? He related what happened to him one evening as he was walking through the city. To paraphrase his story, Suddenly, three people attacked him from behind and knocked him to the ground. He was dazed, and his attackers ransacked through his coat looking for his wallet. He pushed himself up to his feet and confronted his attackers. The attackers were just teenagers, and one might not yet even be a teenager. That youngest attacker stood off to the side doing kung fu-style kicks, trying to look real macho and tough while the older teens stood menacingly over that victim. The pastor knew his very life was threatened. The attackers and this pastor stood eye to eye for just a moment. Then the pastor said something like, What are you doing? I'm a pastor. I am here to help you. There was the briefest pause, and then the attackers turned and ran away. As the youngest of the attackers ran away, he called back, Hey, pastor, pastor, will you ask God for a blessing for me? And then they were gone. Even the most lost person can still see the need for God to give a blessing. But do you think that generally people understand what a blessing from God really involves? I am sure that everyone wants to be blessed by God. But do people understand what that means? Here in the Sermon on the Mount, we see Jesus teaching his followers about blessings from God. This section, as I said, is called the Beatitudes. And the Sermon on the Mount is incredible. The words from our Lord and Savior Jesus are filled with meaning and application for each of our lives. We could easily study the Sermon on the Mount for months and still not exhaust all the things that the Holy Spirit wants to show us. I believe that Jesus has given us his essential message in the Sermon on the Mount. It is a great and beautiful place where Jesus teaches us how we must live our lives. I believe if Christians everywhere would adopt the teachings from the Sermon on the Mount, a huge worldwide awakening and revival would occur. Jesus uses a formula when he teaches, and he starts with blessed are, and then he describes someone's character or attitude, and follows this with the reward for that attitude or activity that he described. But let's first start with what the term blessed means. The term blessed has a rich and deep meaning. Blessed means happy, honored, and favored. Blessed means in wonderful fellowship with God. The blessings come from God, and so do the rewards. As we will see, the blessings are in God's eyes, and the world may not see things God's way. Some translations, such as today's English version, actually use the term happy, like happy are. Jesus begins with blessed are the poor in spirit. This does not just mean those who are struggling with financial difficulties, although other places in scripture do point to God's being on the side of the poor. But poor in spirit has a more specific meaning. Here Jesus is not extolling the virtues of poverty so much as he is speaking about a spiritual condition the poor in spirit. 
Being poor in spirit means that you understand that spiritually we have failed and each of us have really messed up our lives. Being poor in spirit is not being mentally depressed or melancholy, although that might be signs of the inner need. But to put it very simply, being poor in spirit is a cry out to God for help. Being poor in spirit means you are dependent on God. You are humble. The reward for being poor in spirit is the kingdom of heaven. Now, wow, that's a great reward, isn't it? When we cry out to God for salvation, Jesus answers and we can enter his kingdom. That is an eternal reward. For in that blessed eternal kingdom, there will be peace, joy, and love forever. That eternal paradise is where there is no more pain, suffering, or hurts of any kind. In Revelation 7:19, we read that there in that wonderful paradise, heaven, God will wipe every tear from our eyes. Are you poor in spirit? Are you poor in spirit? You will be blessed if you are. Jesus tells us that blessed are those who mourn. God knows your pain. And God can see into every situation that you have ever encountered. God can help you as you feel those deeply painful losses in your life. What do you mourn? Have you lost someone that you love and care for? Where is that most painful thing in your life? Turn it over to Jesus. He can give you comfort. My own father died about 10 years ago this month. I still miss him nearly every day. And that is just one area where I mourn. But not only does Jesus offer comfort to those who have lost important things in this life, like parents or spouses or children or loved ones, but Jesus also comforts those who have turned to him in repentance of our sins. For by saying, blessed are those who mourn, Jesus is connecting this blessing with the first. For when people turn their lives over to Jesus, the world, the world might turn away. And the Christian person will indeed lose some things in the world. We may have friends or family members ignore us and reject us. This is very painful. But Jesus offers comfort. And also Jesus offers comfort when we mourn over our own sinning and when we ask him to forgive and that forgiveness that comfort extends for all eternity are you mourning are you mourning you will be blessed if you are jesus tells us that blessed are the meek now meekness has gotten a bad reputation in our society meekness is not the same as being a wimp meekness is a person who is gentle and honorable in their attitudes. A meek person has no malice or pretension and no selfishness. A meek person will look to the betterment of others. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1, we see that Jesus demonstrated meekness perfectly. We should strive to be meek as Jesus is meek. It is very sad. It's very sad that meekness has not been the hallmark of most Christians for a very long time. Meekness is a matter of wills. Should a Christian live as he or she sees fit? Or should a Christian live under the authority of Jesus Christ? And the meek will live under Jesus' authority. We must be like that little first grade boy who asked his teacher to use the telephone. The teacher said, Oh, Billy, why do you want to use the phone? And Billy responded, Oh, my mother told me not to come home without my sweater. And now I cannot find it anywhere. So I want to call mom and ask her where she wants me to go. That is how we are to be meek, by submitting to God's will for our lives. For the meek will inherit the earth. Well, with the state of the earth in various places, with pollution and whatnot, you might ask, well, who would ever want the earth? Oh, but we know that this does not just mean the current earth, but also the new earth that is created after the great resurrection, part of that new heaven and new earth. Again, we see this blessing has eternal consequences. But you know, meekness doesn't add up always, does it? Do we really need to be meek? Don't we need to be macho and tough? Isn't that the way things operate? Got to be tough? Well, Randy Johnson was a mediocre quarterback for a pretty mundane football team from Oklahoma State University. 
The year was 1966. The football season had been really bad. They had lost more games than they had won, and Randy thought he could still be a hero somehow. For in that last game, they were playing their arch rivals, the University of Oklahoma. But the game was going terribly. Randy's team was down by six points, and it was down to the last play of the game, and they were on their own 20-yard line. The coach thought that there was little hope for victory, and he said to Randy, 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 just call whatever play you want. It really will not matter. And I'm going to put all the seniors in so they can at least say that they played the last game of the last of their senior year. So Randy's team got into the huddle, and Randy called play number 13. Now this was one of those razzle-dazzle plays. They had never, ever used it in a game because it had never, ever worked in practice. But when the ball was snapped, the play worked beautifully. The team scored a touchdown, kicked, kicked the extra point, and won the game. Oh, the crowds went wild. The coach ran over to Randy and said, Randy, what in the world made you call play 13? Randy responded and said, Well, coach, we were in the huddle, and I saw Harry, and he has played so hard, and he was crying. And then I looked over and saw Ralph, and he was crying too. So I thought that I needed to do something for them. So I saw Ralph's number eight and Harry's number seven. So I added eight to seven and called play number 13. The coach waited for a moment, and then he said, uh, Randy, I know math's not your best subject, but 8 and 7 do not make 13. Randy was puzzled. He added it up again, and he said, Oh, gee, coach, if I was as smart as you, we would have lost the game. So being meek might not add up to the world's eyes, but being meek is blessed by God. Are you meek? Are you meek? You will be blessed if you are. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst. What do those words hunger and thirst mean to you? Does it bring up the image of leaving the theater to get a bag of popcorn and a soda? Or does it mean more? Jesus tells us that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are the people who are driven and crave to see righteousness. Now we all have motivations and longings. Are you longing for righteousness or something else? Jesus wants us to desire righteousness. This means that we must strive toward a righteous standing before God. See, this again is connected to the previous blessings by focusing in on our relationship with Jesus Christ. For only Jesus' love can give us a righteous standing before God. But hungering and thirsting for righteousness does not stop with just our right standing before God. But a hunger and thirst for righteousness means that we are striving to be good in our human interactions. Righteousness in our life means having an abiding concern for others and a Christian lifestyle that seeks true justice. And when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be blessed and we will be filled. God will grant to us righteous standing and thus eternal life. And he will empower us to strive toward that righteous behavior and love toward one another. So are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? You will be blessed if you are. Now up to this point in the Beatitudes, the blessings have been toward people's attitudes and inner life. But this last Beatitude has taken us beyond attitudes and now into our behaviors. And Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. Jesus now tells us that we need to interact with others. We need to show mercy. Jesus puts no conditions on the mercy, just that we show mercy. Jesus offered mercy to the oppressed, the rejects of society, the needy and the forgotten. Jesus did not ignore the cries of the needy around him. He showed mercy by hearing the cries of misery, pain, and helplessness. Jesus was alert to the sufferings of those around him. Can we be anything less? We must show mercy as Jesus showed mercy. Mercy is undeserved. No one deserves mercy. But when we show mercy, we will receive mercy from God. What a great gift that is. We can receive mercy from God. Mercy from God is incredible. Do you want mercy? Are you merciful? Are you merciful? You will be blessed if you are. 
Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in heart. Heart means the core being of a person, the source of all our activities. To be pure in heart means to be pure in motives, pure in actions toward others, pure behaviors and pure attitudes. Out of the pure heart comes a correct life. Again, we see how this is all interconnected. Jesus tells us to be pure in heart, meaning pure in everything that we do. That is the goal we must aim for in our entire lives, to live as one pure in heart, not following all the rules in a legalistic and outward conformity, but striving to be pure in heart. And when a person is pure in heart, the pure in heart will see God. This reward begins when we as Christians start to see the image of God in all other human beings as we serve their needs out of a pure heart. And seeing God will ultimately be face to face when we enter eternity with God and spend eternity in blessed fellowship with our Creator and Jesus, our Master and Messiah. Are you striving to be pure in heart? Are you pure in heart? You will be blessed if you are. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, probably the hardest of all. And oh, how we need to be peacemakers in this culture of death. Our world has times where people shoot each other over trivial little matters. And history shows that human beings are nearly constantly killing one another in some form and for nearly any reason. From babies in the womb to elderly people and at every age in between, people are killing each other, even in families. Some families seem more like war zones than like loving homes. And this must really make Jesus sad. And oh, how we need to be peacemakers. That starts in our own lives with our own families. We cannot be peacemakers if we are waging war on each other. We cannot be peacemakers if we are warring with our own families. And the reward for being a peacemaker is that we will be called children of God. And we know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and as his followers, we must be people of peace in our personal lives and in all that we do. Christians must stand as advocates for human life. And Christians must reject killing in any form or for any excuse. We cannot kill. And only then can we really be called peacemakers when we make peace with our families, our societies, our churches, and our world. Only then can peace rule in God's world when it comes from our hearts. And as peacemakers, we'll be called children of God. Are you a peacemaker? Are you a peacemaker? You will be blessed if you are. Jesus tells us, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Here Jesus sums up all the other Beatitudes. For a righteous lifestyle will be one that demonstrates all of the Beatitudes and will be a witness to the world. When you live out a life that is righteous, you will not be living as the world lives. You will be so radically different from the world, and at times the world will be against you. You might be insulted. You may be put down. You might be mocked. You may be abused. You may even be killed for your faith, your faith in Jesus Christ. But no matter what the evil world does, we as Christians cannot follow the evils of the world. We follow our master, Jesus Christ. And what will be the result for those persecuted for righteousness, Jesus says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are you ready to face persecution? Are you ready to face persecution? You'll be blessed if you are. The year was 155, a long time ago, about 120 years after Christ. The Christian church was small, but was growing rapidly all around the known world. And one of the leaders of that early church was Bishop Polycarp. Kind of a strange name, but Bishop Polycarp was a wonderful Christian man. He was 86 years old and was leading his church when they broke in and arrested the entire group of Christians. The police arrested this group and they were brought before the authorities. These believers were questioned in order to renounce Christ, and a few did and left. The other Christians refused to renounce Christ and to live as the world does. And one by one, each of them were killed by the sword for their faith. And they saved Bishop Polycarp for last. The judge reminded Polycarp of his old age. 86 years old, Polycarp. You don't want to die, do you? And then he said, Polycarp, we're going to make an example of you. 
you'll be burned alive till you die. When Polycarp refused to renounce Christ, refused to follow the evils of the world's way, and Bishop Polycarp said, this fire will burn for only a little while, but the fires of hell will burn forever. I will not renounce Christ. And Bishop Polycarp was then burned alive. His final words in the flames were prayers to God. Polycarp prayed, Lord Sovereign God, I thank you that you have deemed me worthy of this moment when I can share in the sufferings of Christ. Bishop Polycarp died a martyr for his faith. Bishop Polycarp knew that being true to God was worth whatever happened. Bishop Polycarp knew that God's blessings were entirely worth the cost. Bishop Polycarp strove to live out the Beatitudes, and many people who saw his death repented and turned to Jesus because of his witness. And Jesus wraps his teachings on the Beatitudes with the beautiful image of the kingdom of heaven. As Christians, we must strive to be all that Jesus commands us in these beautiful Beatitudes. They're tough work. And for we can never force God's blessing, but we can receive it when we live in obedience to God, and we must demonstrate the Beatitudes in all of our life, in our personal lives, in our relationships with others and with God, and especially in how we react to the world. Do you show love? Are you striving to live out the Beatitudes? Are you striving to live out all of the Beatitudes? You will be blessed if you are. I'm John Thornton. Thanks very much for listening to Radio Good News. I encourage you to seek out a church family where you can worship, be encouraged, and live out the Beatitudes, for this area offers many fine Bible-believing and teaching churches of various denominations. You can write to me at Radio Good News, P.O. Box 1722, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57101. And as I said, I'm going to be starting a home Bible study on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you're interested in that, drop me a note and I'll send you some information. May you richly know the blessings of the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come again. And always remember, the Bible says love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. So love Jesus Christ our Lord with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, and love your neighbors as yourselves. And remember, we are even commanded to love our enemies. We'll finish today with another beautiful song from Amy Shreve. <laughs> 